Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Second in Command, a Veep Rewatch podcast. My name is Timothy Simons. I played Jonah Ryan on the television show Veep. I am Matt Walsh, and I played Mike McClintock. And I want to let you know I actually found the piece of paper that Lou wrote down his... Oh, the byline or whatever? The byline. Okay. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. Um, while you're doing that, yeah. we have... We're so unprepared uh, for this gentleman, by the way. Uh, we have... We okay. are... Uh, we're no <laughs> we're out of our near league. smart enough. No. To have uh, this gentleman on our he show. He seems nice. He'll take mercy on us. We have Norm Orenstein, who was a consultant for Veep, uh, especially going into season five. Mm -hmm. And we're honored to have you on the show. Welcome aboard, Norm. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, <laughs> being a consultant on Veep was one of the highlights for me. It so, was so much fun. So can I, and, let me ask you it was because... It particular fun when I would get scripts in advance and they would have absolutely outlandish things in them, and then they'd have to be changed because they happened in real time. Uh, so. Yeah, that's why the show uh, actually stopped after seven seasons. Yeah. Because yeah. it was not a fiction anymore. It was an, yeah. a, an absurd well, reality. So we are a podcast about Veep as dimly perceived through the veil of memory. Okay, write that down. That's perfect. Okay. That was written by one of our writers, Lou Morton. We've been having a like a, a now five season like workshop on what the tagline for the show should be, and we've had a bunch of different iterations. And right now we're working on that one. Uh, the a, a memory of the show is perceived through the veil, the, the dim, dim veil of the dim veil of memory. We'll get there. We're yeah. gonna get it. Now I, I want to ask you a question, Norm. How, what? How would you describe yourself? Uh, what is your career, your profession? I'm a political scientist. Um, I uh, got my PhD from the University of Michigan, taught at uh, Johns Hopkins University in Bologna, Italy, came back to teach at Catholic University in Washington for I believe it's pronounced years. Bologna. One more year at Hopkins, and then I went to a think tank. But I had a little sideline, which is how I got connected with Veep. Uh, which is in 1992, when uh, Comedy Central did its first coverage of elections, my friend Al Franken called me up, and I went up to New York uh, for the Democratic convention there. And it was going to be a one-time thing, but it ended up being uh, something more. So I was Comedy Central's first pollster, <laughs> and... Uh, Al's sidekick in uh, Indecision 92. Really? Uh, wow. Yep. Yeah. And and uh, uh, the young writer, uh, you know, the, one of my recurring bits as pollster was what we called the don't knows. <laughs> and we would do these polls, um, uh, like one of them at the 92 convention with Bill Clinton was the burning issue of Jennifer Flowers, who many hmm. might remember was one of uh, the accused paramours of Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. And so we did a poll of uh, whether uh, people thought Bill Clinton had slept with Jennifer Flowers. And we got a certain number who said uh, they didn't know. And we said, what are, who are these don't knows? Because they're the swing voters. And why don't they know? And then we asked if they had slept with Jennifer Flowers. <laughs> And it went on from there. We did these uh, every night. And uh, I can thank David Mandel for some of the best and uh, most creative lines. And that's how I met uh, David. And uh, our friendship uh, grew from there. Did you did you know Al before Indecision 92? So uh, Al and I both grew up in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, the uh, Jewish suburbs. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Actually, some years ago, uh, Walter Mondale had another one of ours, Tom Friedman, uh, out to speak to his law firm. And he called up, uh, Mondale called up me and Al and the Cone brothers because he wanted to do a special introduction. And he said, can you just write something about what it is, this you know suburb of 25,000 people um, that, you know, gave different people these disparate careers. Al said it was the creosote. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, and, I, you know, I was hoping that what might flow from that is that the Cone brothers would have all of us in one of their movies so I could become the new wow. Steve Buscemi. Well, they're still uh, active. That sadly they're still never making... came to pass. Well, don't, don't uh, anyhow, rule it out. Anyhow, Al and I were a couple years apart in age. I knew of him. He knew of me. 
We met uh, at the Democratic Convention in Atlanta in 1988 and just kind of bonded and our families bonded and became very close. So I actually officiated at his daughter uh, Thomason's wedding. Oh, oh wow. Uh, and uh, their first kid's baby naming. So we've had longstanding ties. Oh, that's were sweet. you both? Were you both pretty? You, you, by that point, you guys probably were both pretty established. You as a political scientist and him yeah. in the comedy world at that point, right? Uh, yeah, you know, at that point, Al was, of course, uh, a Saturday Night Live giant. Mm -hmm. um, we actually met the first night of that convention. There was one of these big parties uh, that CNN and USA Today threw, and Al actually came over to me because he was a c-span and news hour junkie and i did a lot of c-span and a lot of news hour and and so we you know just sort of uh talked uh from that point on and shared experiences i will tell you yeah, go ahead. And, and and the audience might like this as well al did a book it was not one of the premier bestsellers although it was called why not me and it was the story of how he became uh, president in the year 2000 <laughs> um, by beating Al Gore in the primaries. And in that book, I, and he ran a populist campaign where the major issue, which Howard Feynman came up with, was uh, ATM fees. <laughs> and, uh, in that book, I am his campaign manager constantly writing memos about how we can't do this because it's blatantly illegal all of which he ignored uh -huh. and in that in that uh book he plays a candidate who is so much like donald trump it's absolutely yeah. astonishing it sounds like and then it. he he wins together we picked uh well along the way more prescience of us there's a parallel with veep here as a running mate he wanted balance so he picked joe lieberman this was months before al gore picked joe lieberman because it was a balanced ticket a reformed jew and an orthodox jew <laughs> <laughs> get all the votes and then we picked an all jewish cabinet and i'm very <laughs> proud that my contribution to that was ralph loren as secretary of the interior uh, <laughs> And in that book, he then gets impeached and removed from office. And I, as his chief of staff, uh, end up going to jail. So I'm hoping there will be more parallels, including that is, chief of staff Mark Meadows. That's yeah. prophetic, man. That Just like yeah. me, very prophetic. I, I had a question earlier. You mentioned that you were or currently are part of a think tank. I always dreamed that that would be the best job in the world. Like, there's not a lot of or heavy lifting. Like, they just come in and say, "What do you think, Tim? And what do you think? What are you and thinking you just about?" Go, All right, I don't like it. You're like, ah, I don't know, sandwiches, but upside down. Yeah, you know what I mean. You know, it's like <laughs> that's what I think your yeah. job is. So, what is a think tank job? So, I am now emeritus, meaning okay. I'm no longer there. But I did this for more than forty years. And it's basically, in some ways, like a university, but without students or faculty meetings which makes it better, hmm. not the student part, but the faculty meeting part. And, you know, you uh, you write, you do commentary, uh, you testify in front of Congress. But for me, it was great because I was really left alone. I could set my own agenda. I could do what I want. I could say what I wanted. And often I said things that gave immense heartburn to the people running the place. <laughs> but uh, nobody ever said to me, you can't do that. And do think tanks hire lobbyists? No. They don't. Well, you know, they have somebody on board who does liaison with Congress and the executive branch, but no lobbying. And actually, if you are a 501c3, as they mostly are, you are very limited in what you can do in terms of lobbying. But then you have the Heritage Foundation, which created its own 501c4. We're getting into the weeds here another uh, tax status where you can do lobbying, and it's basically just a right-wing political organization now. It's not a think tank anymore. I think that was going to lead me into it's both it. both educational and I, depressing. The uh, this <laughs> yeah. uh, You're going to hear a lot of questions from me in this world today, which is everything you just said. Do we still live in a world in which that even matters? <laughs> That somebody is like, oh, you're a 501c3. You can't do X, Y. Like, do, yeah. does that even matter anymore? Hardly at all, Okay, uh, actually. And that's in part because there's no enforcement of many of these laws anymore. 
The IRS hasn't done what it's supposed to do. A lot of these organizations use this stuff as a subterfuge so they don't have to disclose their donors and all the dark money flows through them. We get a lot of shuffling of money back and forth across uh, some of these entities. And then in the campaign finance world, you have the organization that's supposed to enforce these things, the Federal Election Commission, and for a very long time, the Republican members all unite together to deadlock it so that they won't do any enforcement so that we have a wild, wild west. So, um, uh, you know, it's I'm not already a great getting time. I'm already getting the sense that well, this, gonna, this I'm, episode's going to be way more depressing well, I'm gonna than try I want to, it to be. I'm going to try to get so. <laughs> OK. In some ways, you are hopeful for our declining democracy because you you still keep doing the work, correct? Yeah. Okay. I still keep doing the work, and I'm not going to stop. So that's positive. And, okay. You know, uh, it's uh, an existential threat that we're dealing with, and I can have a little hope, but, you know, let's face it, it's depressing. It is. Uh, we're surrounded by insane people. Every standard has gone away. Open racism, open homophobic threats are now the normal uh, part of discourse and yeah. that's just not a good thing two things are, so i mentioned earlier you and i both know sean caston who's a congressman friend yeah. of ours from uh good guy very smart good legislation kind of feels humble braggy just be like oh, i know, you know one congressman who's in congress well, i know one congressman so <laughs> okay. yeah, I, well, yeah i get to yeah, say that I, I know you just brought it up a second ago oh sean cast he's not yeah. like a big it's not like saying beyonce but yeah, to but norm still. it's a connection so yeah. that's why it's relevant no i like that oh no wait a minute it's... you know beyonce no i'm getting <laughs> oh damn <laughs> now you're treating me like mike um <laughs> what i want to say is to that end you help sean craft two pieces of legislation one i understood which is basically a, a national ID that you could get through the post office, which is yeah. great for so many reasons. Oh, yeah. And yep. that one could hit. Like, that one, I hope it passes or I hope it has life, et cetera. The other one is a rejiggering of the Constitution, which I just want you to unpack that for us. Basically, my understanding was you would create 12 floating senators and it would adjust the Supreme Court in some way so I want you to speak to that and what it would correct in this de declining democracy. In other words, what is it in response to and what would be the hope in a perfect world if that went through? What would it change? Sure. Uh, let me preface it, Matt, by saying that for all the real wonky wonks out there, if you go to C-SPAN, Sean Caston gave a speech on the floor where he described these bills that was absolutely masterful oh. um and it's really worth watching he's a but friend of mine basically yeah that's that's uh, the congressman yeah. that's a friend of he's a buddy of walsh he's brought yeah. up yes. whatever he okay. probably that's said that one. it's probably Sean in his c-span c-a-s-t-e-n it's probably okay. in his c-span bio go ahead anyways yeah. yeah anyhow um the first part about the senate we have a real problem with the senate and it's been a growing problem and it's uh, getting even worse uh just to put it into simple terms we're almost at a point in the country where 70% uh, of Americans live in just 15 of our states. Wow. Now, yeah. flip that around. And what it means is we're almost at a point where 30% of Americans will elect 70 of the 100 senators. And that 30% is not representative in any way of the diversity of the country or the economic dynamism of the country. So the Senate's becoming increasingly unrepresentative and it's creating a crisis of legitimacy. But it's really hard to change that because there's a provision in the Constitution in Article 5 that says every state is guaranteed equal representation in the Senate. So how do you get around that without blowing up the Constitution? And the way that we conceived of getting around it is that you add at-large senators some of them by region, some of them nationally. You're not saying that states don't have equal representation. They each get two. But, you know, let's say that you had a dozen more senators and a few of them are elected nationally. They're going to have real stature because they're not just representing one state. Others you can elect regionally and it's going to make for a more representative body and it's going to break the logjam. So that was. Are you understanding so far, Tim? 
because this is good stuff. This uh, this, is... No, this is really good. So this is a, a friend of yours? No. <laughs> this is, yeah, the guy who worked with Norm is a dear friend so of that, mine. A dear that fr part you understand. Yeah, that part I know. <laughs> okay. All right, so keep going, Norm. Okay, now it comes to the Supreme Court. <clears throat> and here, if you look at the Constitution, first, the, the uh, Article 1, is twice as long and detailed as Article 2. Article 1 about the Congress, Article 2 about the presidency. That tells you that the framers expected that Congress would be the more dominant body, even though they're presumably equal. Article 3 on the courts is much shorter. And it basically just says there'll be a Supreme Court. It's given very narrow original jurisdiction maritime issues, disputes between the states and the like. And then it says that the Congress can create other courts and give other jurisdiction basically to the Supreme Court. So we have a Supreme Court that has wrested all of this power and now is basically running policy in the country and uh, is moved, of course, in a radical direction, not to mention that it has thrown away every ethical standard that you would expect from a judicial branch. So I just want to say, I want to well, interrupt thing... just for one second to say that yeah. if I am on the Supreme Court, please pick me up in a private jet <laughs> and like let and let me borrow the RV. And my wife needs a house for her mother. My wife needs a house yeah. for her mother. Yeah. All of these things I will sell out. I will be corrupt. I will vote for whatever you want. I just want to say that just because it came up. I want it on the record. You need to talk to a 5014C. A a you need yeah, to find yourself a 5014C or whatever. You you may get on uh, a Republican shortlist if those are <laughs> so, Okay, uh, so the narrow anyhow, Article 3 of the, of the Constitution. One of the things that you could do is take away some of their jurisdiction. Move them back to just their original jurisdiction. A second thing you could do that Sean has in the bill is that you can take away their appellate authority, meaning there, uh, there is nothing in the Constitution that makes the Supreme Court the last appeal for any legislation that comes through. You could give it to a, you know, a, a court that you create, a new court of appeals. That came about because soon after the founding of the Republic, we had this famous Supreme Court decision, Marbury versus Madison, where the Chief Justice, John Marshall at the time, just unilaterally made himself and the court the arbiter of what's constitutional and what's not constitutional. Now, of course, we have a court that basically, if it doesn't like anything that Congress has done, like the Voting Rights Act, says, nah, it's unconstitutional. Take away their ability to do that. Now, you could do those things with simple legislation. You don't need a constitutional amendment just as you could add different justices, more justices to the Supreme Court. And you could do one other thing, which I have long uh, recommended, which is term limits for Supreme Court justices. Mm -hmm. That's so been coming up a lot We got a lot, lot of that packed in. And then there's one other element that Sean has put together, which is to enlarge the House, which has been at 435 members basically since 1910. And it was put into law in 1929. And these districts have grown to be huge ones. They're not representative of much of anything. They're all pretty homogeneous now. And gerrymandering has made it worse. And you could make the place more responsive, reduce some of the distorting impact of the Electoral College by giving more representation to bigger states that they deserve, and there are other benefits that come with it. So we got a lot of stuff in there. It's not that it's likely to happen in the near future, but what Sean has done, Sean Cast uh, Caston has done, is to open up a conversation that we really need to have as a country with a political system, even without Donald Trump being anywhere involved, yeah. Yeah. increasingly distorts outcomes away from what voters want. So yeah. to be clear, too, you're, what you're saying, these bills would not need any constitutional change, correct? They don't supersede the Constitution. Correct. They coexist. They could be simply passed by the Congress and implemented, and there would be no constitutional challenge, theoretically, right? 
Exactly so. That's genius. I, There's nothing in the Constitution that says I can't get an RV. I've checked it. There is nothing in the Constitution that says I can't have an RV. My well, wife's mother one needs that's a house. Uh, My given to you by a wife's very rich person. Mother needs a house. So, <laughs> bringing a bring, so that's awesome though. That, uh, thank you for explaining yes. that because I love that, and I would say that's a sign of hope. The fact that that exercise is happening. Obviously, it's a long shot. But I love it. I love okay. that it's out there. All right. I okay. like that you're going to keep tiny the, the hope. sort of like But look at this guy. He spent good, his life. I know. But you can't quit. This guy keeps fighting. You can't quit. You're, I'm not quitting. Well, I'm just you're saying just I'm, getting in, in there I'm in right a little away. bit of a darker headspace it is. when it comes it's to depressing, this. It's depressing. No doubt. So, Norm, uh, you are a constitutional scholar. When he first approached you, was it really to drill down on this season five electoral tie business like did you know right away what he was talking about do, or like just or just like us did yes. you have to keep asking wait how does this work again or did you know right away what this meant it was right in my wheelhouse actually Tim. yeah i had written a number of pieces in the past about scenarios where you could have a deadlocked electoral college uh, where you'd have to go to the House of Representatives. Just, I want to interrupt um, you just for one moment for anybody that's actually watching this. Uh, I'm reading Dave's text. Walsh is reading Dave's text, but I, I was just wanted to ask if he was texting his very good congressman friend. I'm not texting Sean Casson, dear friend, best okay. friend. All right, cool. I just I saw wish I could his... say I celebrated his daughter's wedding, but I can't say that. I'm sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> Please continue. I knew a lot about what was potentially in the season. And one of the things that, of course, I saw right away, and I saw it throughout the, the three seasons that I consulted on the show, was this sort of demand for verisimilitude. It was, we are going to do broad satire, but we don't want to do anything that wouldn't actually be reality, yeah. be uh, something that could happen. and. I mean, to fast forward ahead, one of the other areas where I got involved was uh, Dave. David called me about the International Criminal Court and oh, yeah. wanted to make sure that they had everything right about how that court would work, about whether you could take somebody and put them there. So I, I called up somebody I knew named Patricia Wald, now deceased but a long time uh, judge on the uh, DC circuit, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, a giant in ju the judiciary, but who had also served a couple of terms on the International Criminal Court so wow. that we could be sure we didn't do anything that was even a little bit off. Because what was happening in the show, season five, had never happened in history, right? There'd never been an electoral college tie. So they were basically saying, if this happened, walk us through the legality so imagine it's happening right yeah yes exactly so was, and you know how it would work in the house and uh and in the senate and uh you know what would happen on different dates were as as a constitutional scholar was there was there okay so like somebody uh, uh back when the passion of the christ came out the mm -hmm. the Mel your Gibb, favorite movie my favorite movie i love mm -hmm. it i i it was a huge hit and nobody expected it. Nobody really expected it to be a hit, whatever. Like, you know, the tracking wasn't there or whatever. It was a true but, indie, yeah. A true indie. But a friend of mine who who had not seen it, but who uh, knew a, a little bit about the business or whatever, was like, imagine if somebody made a movie about your, the most important relationship in your life. Mm -hmm. Like that, that is, you would go see that of course you'd go see that on opening weekend. Like people's right. relationship with Jesus who are really into it, that is like the most important relationship in their life. So of course it was imme immensely successful. Well, I think what I'm about to ask is, was seeing these scripts, like the passion of the Christ for you, like an incredibly- <laughs> This opportunity? Like this opportunity of like, they're gonna dramatize the most important thing that's ever the happened. The thing I care about, yeah. The thing that I care about more than anything. Well, as long as Jim Cazaviel or Cavaziel or whatever his name is wasn't involved, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, like you basically are helping write historical fiction and you yeah. get to imagine all of it happening. My, my question, because 
Veep is very complicated, especially season five with all the procedure yeah. and the recount. And then it comes down to Tim's character, Jonah, yeah. voting for instead of abstaining. So could you explain for me the abstaining element in a vote for president in the Congress? Yes. In the House. In the House. Yeah. So here's what, I mean, what basically happens, and we have had a couple of instances of this in the past, uh, one instance in particular. Um, it didn't involve a tie. It involved, uh, however, no candidate getting a majority uh, of, uh, of the votes. And what happens in the Constitution is that you have to vote by state. The states have to make their own rules. There are some elements that have been written into the rules in the past, but you need 26 votes out of the 50 states. The D.C. Uh, contingent doesn't count in this case. So if you are not going to get to 26 and you have an abstention, then you're going to be deadlocked again. So you have to, and you know, uh, if you if you are a single representative from a state, you have the same power as if you are 52 representatives from California, and they have to vote internally about whether they're going to cast a vote and for whom. So in the Veep scenario, the House went first, and they could have voted for either Julia's character or O'Brien's character, the character named O'Brien. Correct. So in By that state. in that fiction, you were from New Hampshire and there were multiple congressmen. Is it a majority of the New Hampshire congressmen that creates one vote for that candidate? Yes. And in that majority Generally what the yeah, what what's happened uh and what would happen in this case is that the members of the delegation would get together and a majority would decide how they're going to cast the vote. You know, I actually know. I don't think I I don't think I put number. that together till just now. I think in my head, I did not realize that it was all the Congress people from that state getting together. And then if it, and then if enough people abstain and you don't get to 26, it then goes to the Senate. And then yes. the choice will be from the two vice presidential candidates. Correct. Correct. And okay. there they just vote. It's the hundred votes uh, that are uh, that are cast. And just going back to the Congress portion, which relates to the Jonah character, if there's how how many representatives in New Hampshire? I'm going to uh, say forty eight. OK, that, that's I too high. Know. That's way high, dude. No, I think that's no pretty good number. New how Hampshire, many? What's your guess, Norm, for New Hampshire? No, in the New Hampshire delegation, there are two. Oh, OK. okay. So well, there's close. two. OK. So if one of them abstains, that is effectively an abstain vote, correct? Because they don't reach fifty-one well, percent. Okay. If if uh, if you know you're going to have a, a a vote that's cast. If let's say that the two of them deadlock, that one of them wants to vote for Julia, one of them wants to vote for uh, O'Brien, then they're not going to be able to cast a vote. And when if they one go abstains, to go ahead. and the other one says, "No, I'm going to vote for O'Brien." then at least in theory, that's how the state would vote. But wow. that's not a majority, is it? Because you uh, only have one of two. Yeah, uh, but if, if the other one is not going to vote, then it's going to be the uh, one deciding to vote that will make the difference. I see. Feels like, wow. and I'm just throwing this out, it feels like we didn't plan super well for for, for this like everybody was like once they kind of got it they were like we're not going to get here like you're like look we got to like write it in like the employee handbook like what yeah. happens if like 58 raccoons run into the starbucks like what is starbucks yeah. policy on raccoons but like it hard went, to plan but it's hard to plan for and so i'm yeah. sure that there is something in there but it feels like they were just like look we're not gonna get here don't worry about it we're just gonna you know whatever tell them like oh it's like in all the states the congress people you guys get together and then it goes to the senate but like we're not you know what i mean that's uh yeah uh, there's a lot to that uh, you know <laughs> as you know when you're when you're putting a season together you work out the arc of the season as best as you can in advance and then you fill in details as you go along and of course, as you guys know, as well as anybody, part of the challenge is you start to fill in details and then something happens in the real world and you throw those details out and you got to find other things. But it's also, you know, sort of trying to work through from one show to the next, how you're going to pull the strands together to make it work. Yeah. So 
you know, the episodes in the aftermath of the election were, I, there were, there were times, I would say, a little bit of controlled chaos to try and figure out how to get all those pieces together. So, but I thought it worked out brilliantly. Well, right, I, I, I happen to agree with you. It all came around to Jonah having this power was just brilliant. I'm what I'm hearing is that the founding, you're a bad actor because you didn't understand the process. I didn't. You understand got up any and just said abstain. What, you I didn't like, do the research like yeah, no. <laughs> I just let I let the force of my personality carry it. Uh, what I'm hearing is that the founding fathers were like the first comedy writing room. They were getting the arc of the thing well, and then they were trying to fill in details. They probably had like a, you know, they probably had one of those policies like anything goes in the writers room or whatever. I have a two-part question for both well, of you, but really Norm, because he's a little smarter. Okay, I don't know. I think so, I was pretty close on the New Hampshire delegate thing. If Jonah's character got in front of the House and said the state of New Hampshire abstains, correct? I think mm -hmm. that's what you did. Does that mean both those candidates agreed probably in New Hampshire? Yeah. Okay. 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 My second question is, like you're joking about, were there any, like outtakes from the constitution that you've ever read where someone said but what if this electoral college thing has a tie like did was there is there any historical like consideration of the tie when they were getting together in philly and drawing up the constitution not really and no. uh you know it was i think the assumption mostly was that they would reason together the whole idea here was that electors would actually be real people making decisions but a lot of the mechanics of this didn't come up until the 12th Amendment, when we had this controversy over the president and vice president being um, uh, elected separately. And uh, the 1800 election didn't give them quite what they wanted. So they worked out some more details there. But the details that they worked out are in a lot of ways not what you really want. Well, Tim, you, you know really the 12th want to have Amendment, a situation right? where you either have a tie or which now you could easily weave a scenario of a tie down the road or a situation where nobody gets a majority. And what the Constitution says is then the top three in electoral votes go to the House and they vote by state. But the idea of voting by state, where you could have all this turmoil within states, and yeah. you could have these abstentions, and you could reach a point where you couldn't select a president, I don't think they thought that through uh, very well. And of course, they bent over backwards to give more power to the states instead of to the individual members. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, you know, bring it forward to not quite the present day, January 6th, 2020. One. I, if Donald you're asking, I wasn't, there. I, was I wasn't yeah. there. Tim and I were I, together. We have alibis. We were, at Al we, we were at Applebee's. We were at Applebee's together. Yeah. Uh, yes, we, we did were. not rent an RV in Maryland and drive up. We did not. The Applebee's okay. was in Maryland. We were obviously, we were on that coast, but we weren't there. Yeah. If that's what you're getting at. Go ahead. I don't think he was. Uh, okay. I'll take your word <laughs> for it provisionally. Okay. Um, but I sure did see guys that looked like you. Well, there's a lot of, yeah. <laughs> We're types. I mean, we are types, of course. And you're proud and you're boys. <laughs> okay. I love a hat Anyhow, with horns on it. What Trump wanted to do was to throw out enough electoral votes or create enough division that they couldn't make a decision. And then it would have to go to the House because the state delegations have a majority of Republicans. 27 states out of the 50 have Republican mm -hmm. majorities. So, and that's something we have to worry about in 2024. And that's one of the things, uh, we have this group, No Labels, that is threatening to put up a, a, a No Labels candidate, maybe Joe Manchin, because of their fictional belief that Joe Biden is as extreme as Donald Trump and they need a huh. candidate in the middle. That candidate, if the no labels candidate won a couple of states, it could theoretically throw the election to the House. And, you know, you could have a situation where Joe Biden won the popular vote going away, but it wouldn't matter. And a lot of these representatives, even if they are in districts that Biden won, if they're Republicans, they would vote for the Republican. 
So we could have an election snatched away again. And be, Walsh, how are you feeling about that hope? How are you feeling about that, uh, that it's hope? It's diminishing, but I'm not oh, quitting. Okay. My question related to this is, do we have Trump on record saying, here's our strategy? We own the state houses, so if we can get rid of some of these, like, do we have him on tape saying that? Or do we have we someone do testifying? Do we have someone testifying but, and saying, like somebody in his thing that's turned? Yeah. What, what we know is that he, he knew full well what delay would do, and it was part of the strategy of the you know, people advising him, like John Eastman. And you know, he was also trying, starting with Georgia, if he could flip Georgia to then get Pennsylvania and, their, the, and its, delegate, uh, its uh, representatives in uh, their state legislature, dominated by Republicans, to put up an alternative slate to create enough uncertainty that you couldn't get electoral votes counted to add up to 270 to then send it to the House. But then the other, of course, the fallback was uh, get everybody killed on January 6th, and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so I don't mean to laugh. That was the fallback. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, gee, I did just Applebee's, ask your question on there. Check that out. Oh, sure. I, I'm going to throw this question out, and I'm going to make this a question that I ask everybody that comes on the show from here on out. I did not come up with this question. I can't remember where it came from, whether it was from like the second in command subreddit or like somebody emailed it in. But on your best day, how many members of Congress do you think you could beat up? That I could beat up? Yeah. Okay. Or like if they um, fought you, who's going to And play? I'm going to let him... Increase the number. You can fight dirty and you can have the element of surprise, yeah. <laughs> but no weapons, right? No weapons. Okay. Yeah, no okay. weapons, but no AR-15. What's that? No AR-15. No, no, no. That's a weapon. Uh, okay. No, that's a weapon. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> um, look, in my heyday, okay. I could have done reasonably well, yeah. okay. but I'm older now. Yeah. And, do you, okay, uh, so let's talk about. I hate. do know that uh, both Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert would kick the shit out of me. Yeah. Uh, she, yeah. So she, I wouldn't want to take them on. Yeah. Even uh, with the element of surprise, because they would fight yeah. dirty and they would. Yeah. But I would love to fight Elise Stefanik. <laughs> that, <laughs> do you that's think, a good get for the show. That's a that, good one. This that, is good. Do you think episode. in your heyday, do you think 50 percent? You think like more than 50 percent? Where are you less? going with? I don't know if I no, like no, this. No, like, you know, you've got a number of former athletes. Oh, you got yeah, some that's big true. People. Almost you know, Colin Walker. Allred, who's a terrific guy, who's now running for the Senate in Texas to defeat Ted Cruz, cool. was an NFL lineman. You those do are, not want to mess with Colin uh, Allred. Those are just uh, human specimens, that size yeah. and that yeah. natural strength. Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. So just I to think... tell you, because I had a cousin, not to brag, I had a cousin who played in the NFL, and he was a lineman, uh -huh. and he said that all these other athletes on the team, the running backs, quarterbacks, receivers, would pump weights, etc. And the big dudes would just show up for, for training because they're just big fucking dudes and they got it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So that's Colin Allred, that, for example. Yeah. yeah. Is there anybody else that you know that you want to? Uh, whatever. I don't want to. I'm sure <laughs> Norm wanna... would be interested, but you would probably get insecure. I uh, Here's another question that I have. So you've been following Congress for a long time, and we've heard yeah. varying stories. But, like, what do, you, what do you think the moment was that, and I've heard, I even, I think I even read an article where you were talking about the effect that Newt Gingrich had on Congress. Yeah. But do you remember... Like, what was the moment for you where C Congress switched over to the, no offense to anyone in the House of Representatives, like the absolute sort of like fucking clown show that it can be now? Okay, so I uh, have done a number of books about Congress. Yeah. One in 2006 was called The Broken Branch, how Congress is failing America and how to get it back on track. Okay. And in that one... You know, uh, my uh, co-author and I assess some of the blame to Democrats, but more to Republicans. And we kicked off that book with a story about a three-hour vote uh, at three in the morning on Medicare prescription drugs with a vote that's supposed to last for 15 minutes under the rules. And it was three hours and there was arm twisting and illegal activity and all kinds of other things. 
done by then speaker Dennis Hastert, mm -hmm. who at the time Wrestling coach. was not identified as a child molester. Yeah. Um, that came much later. But that was in some ways the beginning of the change. But then we did a book in 2012 called It's Even Worse Than It Looks. <laughs> and that's one where we pinpointed Gingrich. But we could see that coming with Gingrich, who I met right after he came to Congress in January of 1979. And he already had his full-blown strategy and all the tactics to try and wrest the majority away from Democrats. And that included tribalizing our politics, re misusing the ethics uh, process to criminalize behavior, you know, recruiting a bunch of batshit crazy radicals. Newt had a lot to do with uh, where we are uh, today. Apologies for my ignorance on this, but did Newt, Newt predated the Tea Party, right? He was, he, he was well established oh, yeah. by the time they came in. So, Newt came in in 1978. Oh, okay. Uh, it was his third time running. Uh, he had been a, you know, a, a history professor at a small college in Georgia. And right after he arrived, I had created uh, with my partner in uh, all of this stuff, Tom Mann, a project on Congress at the think tank. And we did a series of, for two years, of off the record dinners with new members of the class of 78, just to try and follow them through their first two years to get a window into Congress. For That's them. really cool. And, yeah. And, you know, it was interesting because we chose quite well incoming members. We had Newt Gingrich. We had Geraldine Ferraro, who, of course, went on to be the vice presidential nominee. And we had Dick Cheney, among others. Wow. wow. But interestingly, Newt dominated the conversation. And it was basically how I'm going to transform Congress so that people hate it so much that they'll throw the ins out and bring the outs in. And it took him 16 years uh, from 1978 to 1994, but he then succeeded. And that really sent us down a very bad path. I will say that, uh, you know, in all the decades that I've been around Congress, I've gotten to know the majority of members some of them very well. And over decades, I worked with lots of Republicans, closely with lots of Republicans. There isn't one of them in Congress now that I can even talk to. Uh, it's just a very, very different place. And it's a party that's, you know, Newt basically began the process of transforming it into a cult. Yeah. It's not a traditional party anymore. And what was the big, like, wave of Tea Party candidates that got in. What year was that? That was 2010. 2010. It was, you know, Barack Obama comes in. There's a huge backlash because we had the financial collapse that actually preceded Obama. It happened under George W. Bush. And he was but, black. And he was black. <laughs> uh, yeah. That made a difference. Yeah. And the Tea Party that got framed as an, you know, economic backlash, and that's how it was framed, but most of these people, it was far more about the cultural issues, including the racism. But that really created a kind of radicalism. And it's one of those things that we discussed a lot in that book. It's even worse than it looks, because a lot of those Tea Party people were recruited by this group of House Republicans who called themselves the Young Guns. Mm. And it was Paul Ryan and Kevin McCarthy mm -hmm. and Eric Cantor. And they tried to do an end run around their leader, uh, who became the speaker, John Boehner, and, you know, radicalized these people uh, into coming in and saying they were going to, you know, hold the debt ceiling hostage. That was the first time we had a serious threat to the full faith and credit of the U.S. And they were going to try and blow everything up. And, of course, the these young guns thought that they would co-opt all of these members coming in, and they, they're the ones who got co-opted. But that sent us down this very bad path. Yeah, because our... And it got more radical since. Yeah, my immersion, obviously, into politics in a deeper way was through the show. And I think 2011, when we were researching the pilot, yeah. we got to meet congressmen and assistants to congressmen yeah. and toured the White House and all that. And I do remember in the House, people, whoever we were talking to, 2011, I guess it was. They yeah, were saying, like, right. 
these fucking idiot they're talking about the tea party guys like they won't shut up like there's 535 of us this isn't the senate where you get to orate and bullshit just fucking vote and sit down and they said they won't they were ignoring procedure they were ignoring precedent they were ignoring decency and that was my initial like oh wow this is i mean we would have when we were doing research for the show and for the pilot would have been uh like late february or march of 2011, 2011 so we would have been seeing like that first wave yeah. of people being sworn in like that first tea party exactly. wave would have been right there yeah and it's and, so interesting you know, they, yeah uh, rebelled against their own leaders and you know forced a boehner out eventually one of the young guns paul ryan then became speaker mm -hmm until he left because uh, he couldn't control them anymore. It and now, and Eric Cantor got beaten in his own district yeah. by um, a Tea Party nut. Uh, and, uh, and now, of course, we have Kevin McCarthy. So the residue, the detritus of all of that is still around and still stinking up the joint. The... Uh... I, I I always think of it like they are they're always like Paul uh, like Paul Reiser in Aliens where he's like no 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 like I can control it I, I'm yeah. I've got this handled <laughs> you know what I mean they're like the people in the sci-fi movies that are like no 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 I'm the one that can control this monster like the fence around Jurassic Park like don't yes. worry they, the dinosaurs can't get through no this thing. we like yeah. we like genetically it's electricity it's yeah they're not gonna get over they're this. not gonna get through that <laughs> I have one quick question yeah when it comes to the and it's related to Veep sort of when it comes to, say, Nevada, where Selena's fictional recount happened, what specifically does the Constitution say about recounts by state in a presidential election? Do they just say, at this point, the states handle it, or is there any sort of leading direction in the Constitution about those sort of recount events? No, it's, an, it's, it's up to the states. And basically, the Constitution gives the state legislatures the authority to set the terms of their own state elections with the proviso that Congress can override them if it wants to, but Congress has not done that. And we actually had a real concern for a while that may come back over this sort of radical theory, the independent state legislature's theory that said that, you know, came from some of these radical Supreme Court justices that said that the state legislature means just the legislature, the state house and Senate, that even if the state court says, no, what they've done violates the state uh, constitution, they can ignore it. They don't it. have any rule. We've bypassed at least for now that possibility, but it's really up to the state to determine it. And then, you know, there are procedures and some of them are constitutional. Some of them are not over how a state ends up certifying its votes and sending the electoral slate to the National Archives and then to Congress and then sending the electors to actually cast their votes on that one day when the electors themselves vote. I, I obviously also, was state not. state has its own rules about how you control the electors. There are some states now that say if you have like a, um, a rogue elector, one who is presumably selected for one party, but then wants to cast a vote for the other, which we've had happen occasionally before, that there are some states that say, no, you're automatically thrown out and we'll put somebody else in place. But there are others where if you don't abide by the rules and you're an elector, the worst thing that happens to you is you get a fine of like $1,000. So if you had a really close election, and it was if one you of don't... the other things that we could have worked out in this scenario wow. was that you have a tie, but then one of the electors, you know, Threw away directly the... says, so if no, you I'm going to vote for the other. I mean, guy. Howard Schultz, when he's creating <laughs> Starbucks, he's not thinking about the 28 raccoons that are going to get in. You know That's what I mean? Really like, he's point. just trying to think about the best possible coffee in the, in the shortest amount of time. He's not thinking about the raccoons. Norm, were you around? No, but then, uh, <laughs> of course, he then 
tried to get into politics himself, and I'm glad that he ended up sticking to making coffee. Yeah, I will turns say, out he's better at making coffee. Every once in a while, the, I think the hope that I do have. I love when rich guys get into an election, though, like Bloomberg. It's just fun. Well, I it's love just it. just fun. I love it only because everybody so immediately is like, fuck you, get out of here. Like, get out of here. That is what gives me hope, is that it does not matter what side of the aisle anyone is on like when somebody like howard schultz gets into politics they're like shut the fuck up get out of here nobody wants this like truly nobody wants this yeah they're and they always come in with the same thing they're like well i'm just gonna run it like a business like shut up oh my god shut up it makes me so happy when they get just like when they're just like no you're you're gone goodbye uh norm I want to ask you, were you advised or counseled during the Gore 2000 election when it, when it became the recount? Were, were people in that campaign going, talk to Norm? Because you know the Constitution pretty well at that point. You were an established expert, right? I was. I, I have to say I was not consulted. Okay. They should have consulted I be- me. <laughs> That's why I asked. That's why I'm asking you. Al Gore could have become president. Imagine where we'd be now. Oh, my gosh. The environment climate would, change yeah would be the environment different place the supreme court would be in a different place yeah well uh, if I get the time let machine. me just check let me check in on again on that hope that you were talking about at the beginning well, of this episode to be completely honest because i probably don't look as deeply into politics certainly as norm or you i can afford the glossy view of the world but, i don't i don't wallow in it when i when it gets too depressing i change the channel okay i don't stay in the deep darkness of it all so i have pollyanna eyes a little bit so i I I admit that i do want to say i i appreciate i do appreciate about you walsh that you have that you have a a positive outlook on on the future well i'll say it to norm thank you for your service norm i think guys like you Sean Casson, my dear friend, <laughs> you motherfucker. you're doing the good. I mean, whatever it's, it's might be in a vacuum, but fuck it. I love it. I yeah. mean, and we're giving them some, uh, audience. Well, small, uh, this is a very small audience, Norm, but I like that you're on our show. And Norm, we've, we've called a little bit of an audible, uh, while we're here. We're actually, we're, we're kind of not going to talk about episode. Well, we haven't. So we kind of yeah. haven't. So we're actually just going to kind of do this as like a complete one-off of just a conversation with you just because this is honestly been. Although before you get further, I have to say that was such a great episode. Isn't it? Oh my God. Episode in so many ways. Well, speak and to it. I, Go ahead. Yeah. I hadn't watched it since it aired. And it just, it blew me away. I mean, first of all, of course, all the stuff going on in Nevada, count the votes, don't count the votes, all of that was just so brilliant. But the way the interactions in the hospital and the ups and downs uh, in uh, in Selena's emotions, uh, it was just, it's just such a brilliant episode uh, in many ways, sort of emblematic of so many things. Uh, all the different relationships, uh, and so much more. Well, Dave uh, Mandel, a dear friend of mine as well. I know Um, him too. (laughs) He said that he was proud of this one because it was that thing of the personal and political being really balanced. It wasn't... Because Selena cannot engage about her mother's death. She is so, like, not willing to look at it in any real way or excavate the relationship. She's So it's beautiful, and meanwhile... The landslide of all the political nonsense is just washing over constantly. So, yeah. And off of that episode, I wanted to ask you this question. So there is a moment in the episode where she is having that conversation with Kent where he's like, oh, I, I chose a, a, a parabolic path, a parabolic path uh, uh, not intentionally out of earshot where she is talking about. She has to, you know, she has to pull the plug and she's basically asking him, do you. Uh, do you think that the the pole bump that I'm getting from her being on life support would be equal to the po- like? Should I leave her plugged in for a yeah. little while? Yeah. Or should I pull it? And he's like, well, you know, you get an even bigger bump if you do that. So she's really making that decision based off of the assumed poll numbers. And I wanted to ask, in all of your time in Congress. Have you ever seen anybody do anything that is that, I don't even, like, 
it, oh shameless shameless like, or uh have you ever seen it up close did you ever hear rumor have you ever met somebody that's like oh i know the person that would do that i bet he knows many i well I, you know i i hate to get into this too much because yeah. it's too sensitive but i watched a number of senators who called for al franken's resignation knowing yeah. full well that it was the wrong thing to do, but displaying a level of moral cowardice that was based on a belief that if they didn't do it, they would catch serious flack back home. But that aside, every day now, I see people who make Selena in that episode look like Mother Teresa. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's, I mean, I'll start with one of my favorite whipping people, Elise Stefanik, just an utter hypocrite. But then, you know, when Liz Cheney said, and I think it's absolutely accurate, when she called for, uh, when she voted to uh, say that the election had not been stolen, when she voted to impeach Trump, she said, I've had a hundred of my Republican colleagues come up to me and say, you did the right thing, but I just can't. Ugh. And Ugh. that's just the kind of thing that we're talking about. Yeah. Now, would they do it for their own uh, family members? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They'd do the same goddamn thing. <laughs> uh, so there's your answer. Yeah. So I also... Uh, I want to throw this one out at you. Being around the show this long, there is this thing about like senators stick around a little bit longer. Congress people can be there for a long time, but there's a lot yeah. more churn, a lot more turnover. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, the dude uh, Aaron Schock, the guy who was caught like yeah. camp like campaign finance. Like, that was such a huge story, and now he's just kind of gone. I think they actually interviewed him for Veep at some point. I think maybe after season, I think for season six, because mm -hmm. they were talking about, like, what's it like being out of politics after you've been in it? Yeah. But uh, you kind of have, like, this rotating cast. In Who is, in your memory, the dumbest, funny congressperson? The one that's like, oh, you're not really doing harm. You're not actively making the country worse but you are so dumb it's funny. Can I the, vote too? Yeah, well yeah, what, sure. What about the George, is it George Santos, the guy with the fake resume? Yeah. That's pretty funny. That's funny. That is, that's ridiculously yeah. stupid, that guy. But anyways, you're the expert, Norm. Well, uh, so the, the best story is for six years, there was a Senator Scott from Virginia and there was a magazine long defunct called New Times that had a cover story, the 10 dumbest members of Congress. <laughs> and oh, we got a laugh from Scott, our engineer. That's a good sign. Scott was number one. Oh, really? he, oh, wow. He held a press conference with a letter from a psychiatrist insisting that he was not the dumbest member of Congress. <laughs> oh, my God. You, I mean, this is sort of veep on mushrooms uh, <laughs> that's that, amazing that is a hundred percent like if somebody if somebody was like jonah ryan's the dumbest member of congress he would be like here is my pediatrician's note that says yes. i am not that is a hundred yeah. was uh was dan quayle as dumb as his reputation no actually i have to say i knew quayle when he was in the senate uh-huh and if he's not a dumb guy, he's not a uh, intellectual, he's not a genius, <laughs> yeah. but he's not dumb. And if he had stayed in the Senate, if Bush had not picked him, I think he would have developed a reputation as a kind of reasonably uh, decent senator. Decent guy, yeah. But the worst thing that happened to him was becoming vice president, where his shortcomings and naivete. Yeah. Magnified uh, became more significant. Yeah, we have had we have some really dumb people who are there now, <laughs> including in the Senate. Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee is just dumb as a post. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, they're also dangerous. Yes, uh, you know it's yes. not just like Tommy Tuberville. Yes. Oh really, yeah, really dumb, but yeah. also a racist, 
uh, who's you know trying to destroy our national security. So this is not benign. Uh, right. Yeah, that's like I will say. Right. Like I have a friend who is a hundred percent right when he says this. That Donald Trump is he famous, your friend, because it makes the story more interesting. If well, you're I'm behind the scenes, I mean, I he you know he's a showrunner. Okay. Um, <laughs> he <laughs> so he is like if it weren't for the fact that he is so inherently dangerous to the country. Yeah. Donald Trump is legitimately one of the funniest people who's ever lived. One time my family, like when I was in like middle school, we took like a bus trip to DC, you know, where you like, you know, the, you get on a bus and you go down there and like, you know, you go to, everybody stays at the same hotel, they drop you off at all the museums, whatever. And I remember they like took us to dinner one time and they had like a dinner show and it was a guy doing like playing like, you know, piano and saying like, you know, I'm my own grandpa, like mm -hmm. doing those songs. <laughs> Donald Trump as the guy who like plays the piano and sings I'm my own grandpa and then does crowd work in between like the sort of like jokey songs mm -hmm. would probably be one of the best shows you'd ever see. I, I can't go there, but I hear you. Okay. I don't even know. I, I don't understand know how to that you can't engage with it. Yeah. No, I just, it's a hard experiment to imagine for me. Okay. I just throw it in. Too I'm much just emotional. It yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I see what Norm says. Is no, I, you know, if you think about Trump before he got into politics, he was in some ways just a caricature of himself. Yeah. And, you know, creating false PR agents give. Uh, some of Trump's talking points mm -hmm. or uh, getting the New York Post to run the headline, Marla Maples says, Trump gave me the best sex I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, that's funny stuff. Yeah, pre-politics, you're but right. it's hard to think of him as a funny character now. No, I know. No, pre-politics, you're right, because there's a million stories like that. Like, yeah. And you again, that also requires you to like not think about the Central Park Five thing. Like I'm, so I'm not trying. I'm not really yeah. trying to say that if you just take the politics out of it, I just think he you know he's good at crowd work. It's just it just happens that the crowd work he's doing is for Nazis. Uh, that I'm also going to throw this one out. There's a moment uh, in I think the next episode where Selena says something about the Senate is like Caligula's Rome, or no, Congress. The House is like Caligula's Rome. And I'm wondering, in your experience, do you think that per capita there are as many affairs in Congress as there are in Senate? Or do you think it's sort of like per capita, it's probably politicians sort of cheat on their significant others evenly Ooh. across the board? If you had to stereotype. That's if you had a to hard stereotype. One, uh, to say, but uh, I would say there'll be plenty of that in both houses. <laughs> um, and, you know, it used to, we used to, I used to say, a long time ago that Congress is probably not so much like the entire country, but if you look at any profession, the legal profession, the medical profession, the architectural profession, that it's probably got roughly the same amount of alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, sexual misbehavior. I think in some ways that part of it is probably less now, a little bit less than it was, but it's been replaced by insurrection, racism. Uh, you know, you're getting people who may not, who may be more pristine in their private behavior. Mm -hmm. Although obviously there are exceptions to that, like yeah. Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and uh, George Santos mm -hmm. and many, many others. Uh, but uh, if we had to do a trade-off, I'd rather have people who were messy in their personal lives, but uh, had a little bit better behavior when it comes to yeah. protecting our fundamental values. Yeah. Decent on the floor. Yeah, I agree. I, I have one more question. In sixth grade, were you the kid who memorized the Constitution? Was there a moment where you're like, holy shit, I'm going to be studying this thing forever? I had a... a you don't get credit for it. Uh, no, I had. I was you a lot don't get like credit for my question. I'm going to ask a follow-up when don't he's done. You don't get credit. All right, go ahead. asking for credit. All right. I feel like my, uh, my so performance here gives me the credit that I deserve. It's a complicated answer for me. Love um, it. My father was Canadian, and I actually spent a fair amount of my formative life, including uh, sixth grade all the way through high school in Canada before moving back to Minnesota, where I had been born and had fundamentally been raised. 
as long as we're going to do a little of the humble brag, I went to high school with Neil Young. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. That's yep. pretty good. I don't have anybody from uh, high school. That's before. pretty good. But yeah. uh, but my family had been uh, in Minnesota. My mother's side of the family had been very much involved with politics. My grandfather, who had come from Russia, ended up as the head of the Laundry Workers Union in Minneapolis and was one of the people who got Hubert Humphrey into politics, helped him get elected mayor, and then set him off on his career. Wow. And I actually, you know, spent a lot of time around a lot of these Minnesota politicians, Mondale, Humphrey, Orville Freeman. I worked for a while for a congressman from Minneapolis named Don Fraser. But, you know, my sort of interest in the larger dynamics, Congress, the Constitution, that came a little bit later. Okay. The question that I was going to ask in my little follow-up, uh, and you may have answered it already, was that you're in your as a kid was there like a congressperson or something that you looked up to like a sports hero like did did they occupy do people in congress or yeah. people they occupy you, your brain in that way uh, yeah i mean I, you know my whole family venerated hubert humphrey mm -hmm. yeah um i had an uncle who served in the minnesota legislature and before that had been in the attorney general's office in minnesota working under Walter Mondale. So I grew up with the uh, Mondale, Fraser, Humphrey sort of nexus. I saw them as just great heroes, you know, yeah. bearers of high moral standards implemented into practical political life. Now, I will say back in those days, the Republican Party in Minnesota was a pretty respectable party. They had their own uh, sort of moderate figures, and there were a couple of those who I thought were really, really good as well. But it became one of the first states that kind of pointed the spear in which the Republican Party went full-blown batshit crazy, uh, which is where it is now. But I, you know, I grew up venerating politics and politicians and uh, while well, recognizing the imperfections in all of this. Any, uh, any regrets? <laughs> um, that's a great question that's a yes or no question that's a yes or no question i, few, I would say I yes sing, but i don't want to sing um <laughs> in terms of uh the arc of what i've done my only regret is that i wasn't able to be in a cone brothers movie it's not done yet there's still talking time. about no, right. they're still making movies joel that's Ethan, they if listen. you're listening, they are. They definitely are. Be. Do something, please. Throw out your uh, your. What's your favorite, Cohen Brothers? Um, I'd say Joel. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you meant movie. I meant movie. <laughs> <laughs> Now you're only ever going to get cast in the one he does. <laughs> they always work together. No, but they've been, they're they been about to work together, but they've okay. been working separately the last okay. couple of years. Oh, man, this is great. What's your favorite no, I, Coen I mean, Brothers movie? It has movie? to be Fargo. Fargo? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. If you could be in a Coen Brothers movie, what era would you like to be set in and what kind of character would you like to play? Yeah. I, uh, I you know, uh, the 1930s. Mm -hmm. I love the 1930s, and I just like to be uh, like a, a Steve Buscemi-like character. All right, cool. He's just so good. Oh, I yeah. love him. I love him. I'd like you to be like a fixer where you can get people in to see somebody. I think you That be... I could do. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, yeah. somebody needs something to happen. Polit city politics, we can set it in Minneapolis, but it's like they got to go yeah. see Norm, who can get the meeting to get yeah. to the guy. Not And... It's it's only two days work, Norm. I mean, you, you you're not box office, right? Yeah. But I but yeah, I not think yet. but I think it's a two day part. I mean, yeah. you you get the exterior and then we do the interior scene. And you're gonna be, I mean, you're gonna be working opposite uh, uh, Francis McDormand. Francis will be McDormand's gonna be there. Of course. I, I picture it's like a poker game behind some grocery. Yeah. And it's a quasi criminal dude, but his brother is like a legit sort of clean politician, and that's what like sort of norm helps the conduit happen like somebody actually wants to do good and norm's got to walk them into johnny rocco or that's the bad name but and then eventually so you propel the story and they can't cut you norm because it's story yeah. like how did how did yeah, they meet johnny rocco how did they get to the congressman yeah yeah 
All You're right. halfway under the screenplay there already. <laughs> I was uh, just improvising, but I think it could work. Joel and Ethan, I know, we know you're listening. Disregard what he said about having a favorite between. Work together and put Norm in one of your movies. Yeah, well, that goes to Tim and I always have a section at the end because we're kind of wrapping up here. You can walk back anything you said on our podcast. Yeah. Or you can double down on anything you said in your podcast. Just podcasts. like a politician, if you want to walk back something, you walk back something. If you want to double down on something, here's your chance. Never complain, never explain. Uh, I don't walk back anything. Hell. And I'll double yes. down on every part of it. Hell. You'll never, you'll never be a congressman, but I like it. Oh, my God. I love that so much. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Norm. Norm, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on, for agreeing to coming on, and well, thank you for So much fun for me, and you guys... We're just pitch perfect in <laughs> every season. Just pitch perfect. Uh, Thank you. And this show, uh, the show has legs. It will be uh, around for many decades. People are going to look back on it uh, as one of the all-time greats. Oh. It's funny because a lot of people tell me it helps them go to sleep, and I don't understand that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Truthfully, like, <laughs> I've seen the show. I like to watch it before I go to bed. Norm, what Thank a pleasure. You, Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much for yeah. your expertise. You really nice to meet you. Good to meet you, too. All right. Peace. I'll tell Sean I talked to you. Please do, my dear oh friend. Oh, my God. Rub it in Everybody Tim's knows face. Sean. Rub it in Tim's face. <laughs> Everybody knows Sean. We'll go deep with Sean later, Norm, you and I. <laughs> okay. All right. All Thank right. you, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Later. Everybody, thanks for listening. That was Norm. That was Norm. like, I love meeting someone like that because I have so many questions and there's such insight. Obviously, yeah. we never talked about the episode. We no, started it, to talk about it. But I mean, at some point, there is just like, he spent his, he spent his entire life studying this. And yeah. also, but like being directly involved with it. So like not only studying what it's like in theory, like also watching it in process. Like his, I don't know, like the, he just knows everything. Yeah, and there must have been such delight when he was asked to consult yeah. On a fictional version of an electoral college tie. He must yeah. have been just like giddy. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was really thanks so much to Norm for coming on. Um, yeah, thank you, This Norm. is uh, Second in Command of e Rewatch Podcast. Uh, I was Timothy Simons. Still Matt Walsh. You can, um, yeah. you email can us. Email at us. Second in Command ATC at Gmail. Uh, you can hit us up on the sub, the Veep subreddit. There is a Second in Command subreddit. There was some drama. Never been. <sighs> That's fine. I should um, figure that out. I patrol. Out. I patrol it. I get some questions you there. Peep? You're a peeper? Yeah, I peep. Peep. I, but I respond. Do I like you? ask for questions. You know what I mean? What's like, the so, drama? Any drama? Oh, well, the drama was with the subreddit. I don't know. The guy that was running it. Like, there's a new one, but I'm not there as much. I think maybe just because I'm hurt from the last one. The guy, like, shut it down and locked it up. And there was, like, he was, like, I don't know. He's kind of, like, I think the power of controlling that subreddit went to his head. Is the subreddit an elected position or just any? No, just anybody, anybody can, can say, it. I'm creating a subreddit. I am now the manager of that subreddit. Yeah, I think so. Are you called manager when you, when you, you sit atop? Administrator? administrator? No, the, what do you call Moderator. The moderator. Says yes. Aaron. Okay. By the way, Aaron, what was, you got a big laugh out of something. It was so funny. Oh, he erupted. The dumbest. The, the 10 dumbest. Ten <laughs> dumbest. <laughs> I can't imagine if a list came out. I was like the ten dumbest. I actors have a letter from my psychiatrist saying I am not. Which is Trump's IQ test. I would crush any of you on an IQ test. Let's do one right now. Let's do one right now. Right. Um, uh, find us wherever you find podcasts. Uh, Apple, uh, uh, Spotify. Uh, on uh, the record shop, uh, rate us five stars. Leave yeah, a review. Leave a review. Let's All read right. a review next time. I think that'd be nice. Oh if yeah, let's read. It'll a review. it'll like give uh, reinforcement for somebody who took the time. Yeah, I think so. Okay, right, that's a good idea. All, All right. right, bye. Peace.